it's all about human destiny and how responsibility for human destiny is distributed. All right. If there's a tech singular, if there's a human singularity, we all get to participate in the decision about our destiny and where it's going and how to realize it. All right. That distributes the, the whole thing over humanity as a whole and no one gets left out. If we have a tech singularity, everything will be controlled by the people who, ca- who own the technology. Those are mega corporations. Okay. Run by people who are not typically very nice or public spirited people. They're highly acquisitive. Okay. They, 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 they tend to be narcissistic, Machiavellian, sadistic sometimes. Basically, these are not all good people. I mean, there are exceptions. There's some people, you know, that, that, that have a lot of money or are in charge of various kinds of technological enterprise that aren't totally bad people. But when you put too many of them together, they start getting the idea that they're elite and they should be in charge. And they start deciding that people are useless eaters. There are too many of them, and for the good of the planet, and really because they're a nuisance, we have to get rid of them. All right? The, the, this kind of talk has been going on for centuries. All right? People, a lot of people aren't aware of it, but the elite tend to form these ideations when left to their own devices. Okay, so if there's a technological singularity with them owning all of the technology, that technology will be used against the human species. It's almost certain. And that is called a parasitic divergence, where they become a parasitic subspecies of the human race, and the rest of us become their host. Now, the human singularity, it's one that you advocate for, something that we should have instead of the technological singularity. What is the human singularity? Well, it's been it's been laid out by others. Uh, for for instance, uh, Teilhard de Chardin. You're probably familiar with him. He was a uh, he was a Jesuit priest who uh, came up with this idea of the omega point. Okay, we're approaching this quickening of consciousness where we're going to realize what we are, who we are, our relationship with God and reality, and fulfill our destiny. And this is going to be this huge worldwide global event. And it's going to save us and allow us to pass through the great filter and realize our destiny. That's what it is. He used that term great filter, or did you just come up with that great filter? No, great filter is a term that's been around for a while. It's basically every species, you know, as it develops technology and starts killing itself with pollution and overpopulation, all the rest of it, every species comes to a point where it, it either has to grow up and live sanely and, and, uh, and, uh, sustainably in its environment, or it dies. Part of the technological singularity, one of the reasons why people are venerating it is because there's the potential for minds to be uploaded into classical oh, really? computers. Really? Really? And whose theory is that? <laughs> right, right. This is what I want to... This is what I want to I mean, ask that, about. That's the, okay, so why do you, there is why no do you, theory. It yeah, has right. no why, underlying Why do you laugh? Theory. Why is it absurd? And let's imagine that it's not classical computers that one uploads their minds to, but some other, maybe quantum computer. Why is that outrageous? Because that's not the way reality is structured. Yeah, reality exists. It exists on other terms entirely. You're not going to build a machine. It is not mechanical. It is, it is meta-mechanical or proto-mechanical. You might be able to call it that, but you're not going to be able to use a universal Turing machine or, for that matter, a quantum Turing machine to simulate it. It can't be done. All right. It, it does not satisfy the requirements for existence. There is no theory. There is no theory of transhumanism, how this whole thing is going to occur. All right. Unless you can point me to a theory. Now, if you can do that, I'll change my mind. I'm an open minded person. I don't think there is such a theory. You just mentioned mechanical. Um, is this because there's a difference between mechanical causation and telic causation? Or is this unrelated to that? Telecausation causation is far more primitive and generative than mechanical causation is. Mechanical causation is incoherent. You have a machine with a bunch of parts that happen to be bolted together in the right way that the machine works, performs a function the way it's supposed to, but they don't work coherently in the sense of quantum mechanics. Telic recursion is coherent in the sense of quantum mechanics. All right, so it's, you know, everything is superposed on each other. All of the possibilities interfere within these quanta of causation called telons, which are just configurations of telors like you. Do you have any thoughts as to entanglement speed? So what I mean by that is some theories predict that there's a maximum 
speed of entanglement. Right now, as far as we can tell, there's no speed to it. It's just instantaneous. I'm curious if in your models, it necessarily has to be the case that entanglement happens everywhere simultaneously, or if there is also a speed associated with it. Well, you're just talking about some kind of terminal lag. In reality, entanglement occurs in the non-terminal domain where things are metasimultaneous. It is not appropriate to try to schedule them the same way things are scheduled in the terminal domain. But there could be a, a little bit of a lag where, yes, there is some measurable amount of time that it takes for things to become entangled once their wave functions hit each other. That is a calculation I have not yet performed. How does one solve the liar's paradox in your model? The Epimenides paradox? The one that says this sentence is false. Right. Well, you simply exclude that kind of sentence from reality. You say, well, that is a pathological construction that is not instantiated in the terminal domain. Unless you can find me an instantiation. And I don't think you can because it's a paradox. So it's akin to naive set theories move to ZFC where they say we can't construct sets that aren't elements of them, the set of all sets that aren't elements of themselves. It's akin to that. You just negate it. You say that's not a possibility. It is a possibility. You just can't involve the negation part. Of it. You can't involve the self-negation part. Of it. You can have sets that are self-inclusive. We've got self-inclusion all over the place. Fractal geometry, there are all kinds of things. Consciousness itself, all kinds of things that, that are self-inclusive. But you can't allow this misuse of the, of the negation functor. Okay, you can't allow that to intrude on them and render them paradoxical. That's what I'm saying. Is there a realm, it's like the pre-infocognitive realm, this primordial place, unbounded telesis place, where, as far as I understand, paradox roams. It's fine. It's just in our experience, our world of the terminal. Right, right. It, it, can, exist, it can exist as a syntactically inconsistent form which is sufficiently well-formed that you can apprehend it or think you apprehend it. But in reality, it is incapable of instantiation. You can formulate it, right? And then you can, you can envision it in the non-terminal realm. You cannot, however, achieve an instantiation, an actualization of it, because it violates the terms of existence in the terminal realm, physical existence, right? What happens after death? <laughs> So there's a couple ways to interpret that. What I mean is, well, let's let's talk about what is death, and what does it mean to die. Well, that's the that's the termination of your relationship with your particular physical body that you have at this present time. When you when you are retracted from this reality, okay, you 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 go you you go back up toward the origin of reality. You can be provided with a substitute body, another terminal, another kind of terminal body. That allows you to keep on existing with the this same is memories. What religion, or this is what glimmer? religions. How, what, excuse me. With a modicum of your memories before, or a complete eraser. For uh, you can have the, these memories can be retained. Nothing goes out of existence in the conspensive method. Your memories can always be pulled back out if that's. But there's no reason to do that usually. Okay. Why cling to memories of a world in which you are no longer instantiated? So there are certain automatic psychological things that happen on death, at the moment of death. And also, you mentioned you mentioned what happens after death. That's not quite appropriate, of course, because that's a temporal preposition. And when you're extracted from the terminal domain, you're no longer time-like. Now you're basically metatemporal. Seeing everything changes. However, you exist that way right now. Arguably, all of your lifetimes, if you were to be reincarnated again and again and again, all of those reincarnations are meta-simultaneous. There is a sense in which they all occur at once in the non terminal mm -hmm. So when people talk about heaven, which I know you have your own views, a specific differentiated view I haven't heard before as to what heaven is and even hell. When people talk about heaven, usually what they mean is something like a reinstantiation of this body with probably a better hairline than I have. And you've got a, a great younger. hairline. Oh, oh bad. Thank <laughs> you. You should see Bernardo Castro, which I should put you in touch with. Have you heard of Bernardo Castro? Uh, I've heard of Bernardo. Yeah. yeah as a matter of fact, I think, I think he was hairline. on email distribution. I was thinking, I think it was one of Jack Sarfati's email distribution. So who's that? Jack who? Jack Sarfati. 
Yeah. Ja- Her- Jack Sofetti is one of the hippies who saved physics. Uh-huh. Do you is read he related that book? to UFOs? Does he study UFOs? Uh, yeah, or yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I think he's working on, he, right now, he's working on metamaterials that uh, that will uh, allow us to build spacecraft that emulate Tic Tacs. Remember those Tic Tacs that the... We're going to talk about that, man. (laughs) I mean, yeah, he's a gonzo physicist, right? But he's been around since the, you know, 1960s. And and, uh, he and there are a bunch of other guys, you know, like uh, Sarag and Nick Herbert and uh, and, uh, Fred Allen Wolf and other people like this. Who, uh, David, there's a guy named David Kaiser. I think he's an MIT. He wrote a book called How the Hippies Saved Physics. And these were the guys, these were, you know, non locality and all the quantum woo you hear about sometimes came from these guys. But in reality, they had a lot of very productive thoughts. And in a way, the world we're living in now is uh, an outgrowth of some of what they were thinking and doing at this stage. 